Hatsamea. We're going to give you a second chance to give us that when we greet our brethren. We're almost live today again. Believe it or not, eight days have passed. Where does the time go? And we look forward to when there's no more time but eternity, right? Yeah. So since our brethren will be watching this all over the world, let's give them a good one, two, three. Ah, <laughs> and having a wonderful feast so far. And if I can call our elder up for Ken from Kenya to give the opening prayer. Let's pray. Yeah, we ask for your blessings this afternoon. And we thank you very much for being with us from the start of this accord until we are almost the ending. You have blessed us in various and millions of ways, each on his own way. We ask for your blessings to be bestowed on each of us, so that you may open our mind, our eyes, and our ears, and you bless us with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, to know where we stand and where we are heading to. Guide us and lead us until your Messiah comes. And in this we pray in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. You can stand. We are going to sing a couple of songs to start. The first one is Crown Him with Many Crowns. It is number 12 in your book.
next song is Sodu Ladonai Kitov, and it means give thanks to Yahweh for he is good. And we have all reason to give thanks to his holy name. It's number 69. Really 
Uh, it takes, you don't believe how much time it takes to put something like this together in all our trips and our tours and our buses, but really when you cooperate, it makes it run so easy. And we were talking about, I think, in all the years we're doing this, this must have been the least problem-free feast, I think, ever. It was really, really a great time. So it's really, I, 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 I thank you. I thank you so much for, for helping and your zeal and uh, your attitude, which is wonderful. Of course, this is our last service. When the service is over, it's been our tradition that we'll go up on the roof and we'll do the closing uh, prayer and benediction up there. And I always read from Daniel, the ninth chapter of Daniel's prayer to Yahweh of bringing the tribes of Israel back to the land. So uh, then tonight, or actually after that, I'd like to have a short meeting at 5 o'clock only with the people that are coming on the pilgrim tour tomorrow morning. We really didn't talk about that at all. But I would like to talk to the people that are coming and coordinating how we're going to go and what we're going to do. So at 5 o'clock, whoever is on the tour, please just come here and we'll have that meeting. Then uh, after dinner, uh, if we can have some hands, many hands make the burden light to help break down. So we need to break down the room. We need to put the doors back up from the back. We need to take down the Sukkot. And usually... If we have a lot of hands, it takes like 45 minutes. It takes us two days to put all this together and about 45 minutes to take it down. So if we can have some help after dinner, of course, after sunset, because it still is the holy day, but uh, we'll do that, and, uh, and we appreciate that. So uh, I think that's all the announcements I have. If I think of any more later, I will give them. But now we have the opportunity. We're going to hear two special musics to start with. Andy? The first one we are blessed to hear is... Well, the national anthem of Israel is called Hatikva. It's the hope. And we're very blessed that Rachel, she'll play for us on her violin. And as we know, the hope, it means the insurance, the same hope that we have, that one day, the hope of our salvation, our Yeshua being here. So, Hatikva. So we thought we'll start out with special music with the young ones, and we have a, another one, Joel. going to sing the song in his time and I just thought it was a really suiting song because of all the stories that we've heard and all the testimonies we've heard and I just think that it's a good a good song to sing to just remember that in his time Yahweh will make all things beautiful.
I'm going to read from 1 Timothy, the third chapter. It says, Faithful is the word. If anyone desires the offer office of an elder, he desires a good work. He who becomes an elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, alert mentally, sensible, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach. Not a drunkard or one whose hand is quick to strike, but humble, not contentious, not loving money, ruling his own house well, having children in subjection with all purity. But if anyone does not know how to rule his own house, how will he care for a congregation of Elohim? He should not be a new disciple, lest being puffed up he may fall into the condemnation of the devil. But he must also have a good witness from those outside, that he not fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. So we have a gentleman that has been part of our congregation and has been leading actually our congregation down in the Houston, Texas area for the last three years and is fulfilling this role. And today, before you, the witnesses, we will lay hands on him and anoint him with oil for eldership. Joseph? If the elders can come up, please, to assist me. We lay hands on Joseph and anoint him. I am going to give him his official charge from Scripture. I'm reading from 2 Timothy 4. Joseph Miller, I solemnly charge you before Yahweh and the Master Yeshua Messiah, he being about to judge the living and the dead at his appearance in his kingdom. Preach the word, stand by it in season and out of season, convict, warn, encourage with all patience and teaching. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but enter themselves extra teachers according to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. But be clear-minded in all, suffer hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Heavenly Father, Father, we come before your throne in heaven, Father, with all praise and thanksgiving and blessing, Father, first of all, that you give us life and you can take dirt from the ground and mix it with water and put your spirit and you can create us, Father, as children of yours. And Father, we humbly thank you for everything you do in our life. We thank you for your commission. We thank you for your word. And most of all, we thank you for sending your son to this earth to die so that our sins could be forgiven. Father, we come now before your throne, and we anoint Joseph Miller, Father, to uh, continue with the work you've given him. He's fulfilling this role in the local congregation. He's being sent out to the Philippines to further the work over there and to help the leadership there to bring more people to salvation, Father, and help to bring your good news around the world. So, Father, we ask that you would anoint him at this time. We ask that you would give him a special uh, anointing of your spirit for the work that he's going to do and the work that he's continuing to do. We pray, Father, for his wife who's about to give birth. We pray for the child that's about to be born to be sanctified in your sight, Father, and to be a warrior of yours as it grows. And Father, we just thank you for Joe. We thank you for everything that he's doing. We thank you for your blessings upon us. And Father, we give you all praise in the name of Yeshua. We pray.
Okay, we have some more special music and more praise before we get into our main message. Where we go by age. So we will continue with our youth choir. There was something, right? Oh no, Tara. Tara? It was you, right? The old great legs. Oh, the girls. Okay, so part of the youth. Say your works are wonderful and amazing, and your roads are straight and peaceful. So we think now, you will interpret. <laughs>
country, maybe the largest in number, the Grand Great Lakes Choir, accompanied by the great piano player, Jordanian Swiss piano player. <laughs>
he was one of the original ones starting the feast with us, and one of our matri matriarchs in the congregation. Praise Yahweh for her. Alrighty, here we are, the last great day. Traditionally, we talk about the White Throne Judgment and some of those things. I'm not going to talk about that today. We have messages online. I talked a little bit about that before. But wow, what a feast, huh? We talked about preparing for the great regathering. You know, we talked about the Kenites, the two sermons on the Kenites. We talked two sermons on being sanctified to Yahweh. And maybe one of the most exciting sermons I ever gave on the Key of David, which is like almost in progress, this sermon and what's going to happen here. So I was praying about also ISIS, talking about ISIS and world events. And since it is our last day together, at least as a group, I really wanted to give something to kind of tie this all in together to the days ahead. Because like I said, every day we leave or every feast we leave, we always say next year in Jerusalem, and we never know. But I don't think there's ever been more uncertainty in the world than today. It's amazing. We have a, uh, a field trip at our Bible school on the strategic threats of Israel. We started doing this in 2010. And the very first year we were doing this with Mayan, uh, that was when the Arab Spring broke out. And it was kind of like, wow, here we are taking our trip with strategic threats the week before the Arab Spring. And then the next year was Egypt, and then the next year Syria. And now the, the border, they had to even close the UN border up there, and all this stuff was ISIS. I'm almost thinking of canceling that trip. Every time we do it, it gets worse. But really, we're living in a very, very dangerous time. And the name of this message is The Remnants Walk in the Mark of the Beast. The Remnants Walk in the Mark of the Beast. And I think it's extremely important with the messages we give, gave to maybe tie it all in together here. I want to start in Revelation 12, in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place, it having been prepared from Elohim, that there, might, that there they might nourish her 1,260 days. And war occurred in heaven... Michael and his cherubs making war against the dragon, and the dragon and his cherubs made war. And they did not have strength, nor yet was their place for them found in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent being called the devil and Satan. And he deceiving the whole inhabitant to a world, which was cast onto the earth, and his cherubs were cast out with him. And remember in Revelation 9, that a star comes out of heaven, which is either Satan or one of these demons. He has the key to the abyss, and he unlocks Tartaros, and all of these demons come up. So this is tied in with this. And I heard a great voice in heaven which said, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our Elohim, and the dominion of his Messiah. Because the accuser of our brethren is cast out, the one who accuses them day and night before our Elohim. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their soul even till death. Because of this, be glad the heavens and those dwelling in them. Woe to the ones dwelling on the earth and in the sea, because the devil came down to you, having great anger, knowing that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he pursued the woman who bore the man-child. And two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman, that she might fly into the wilderness, to her place where she is nourished there, for a time and times and half a times away from the serpent's face, and the serpent screwed water out of his mouth like a river after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried off by the river. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river, which the dragon threw out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged over the woman and went away to make war with the rest of her seed, those keeping the commandments of Yahweh and having the testimony of Yeshua, Messiah. Not really going to get into the woman today uh, and all that, but really I want to start here to show there is a flame. Because, of course, part of this, or maybe even the majority of this, is talking about Judah. You know, it was Judah who bore the man-child, is the one who's fleeing, which again comes from Judah. And that's where we know Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, had to come from Judah to fulfill this. But we also read many scriptures also knowing that the 144,000, the end-time remnant, are also going to be fleeing. Whether it's together here or not, it doesn't make a difference. The point of it is, there's a great fleeing that comes. And as we went over in some of these other messages, you know, 
Uh, I can't tell you right now for sure. You know, I came from a congregation that believed there was one place of safety, so to speak, and everybody was going to get a call in the middle of the night, and even your unconverted relatives and children, and you'd all fly in all these airplanes over the Jordan, and you'd knock on Dolly's door. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they believed. And there, Petra was going to be the place of safety. So, I, I, I don't know if there's one place. Uh, I do know, I believe, from our trip to Jordan and from the things I was sharing with you from those two messages on the record line, I do believe at least a remnant will be going over there. I think when you look at Scripture and what I'm going to go over today, it's going to be pretty evident. There will be a remnant that is fleeing in that direction. And we know when you see the abomination of desolation, we'll read that in a little while, those in Judea flee to the mountains. When we were talking, is that east or west? I think by the time we're finished with this, we'll see initially it's east, and then maybe another direction after that. I think that's why I mentioned why ISIS is attacking the Rechabites today, this, this rare group of Bedouins that has basically been obscure for almost 4,000 years, and all of a sudden now they're coming out even on the news and they're attacking them because of what they're doing, because Satan always tries to stay one step ahead of Yahweh. That's why even before Moses is a man, he's just being born, he's killing all the babies in Egypt before Yeshua. Same thing, is being born, he's inspiring Herod to kill all the babies, to thwart the plan, and he's trying to do this. Let's go to Numbers 24, to just read that scripture again, of what Assyria, who Isis is the revived Syrian Empire, what they will do to these people in the end time. Numbers 24 and verse 14. And this is Balaam's last prophecy, the last prophecy that he's giving. And look what he says. And now behold, I go to my people. Come and I will counsel you what this people shall do to your people in the latter days. So it's definitely a prophecy for our time. And he took up this parable and said... The saying of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the saying of the man whose eyes are open, the saying of him who hears the words of El, and he knowing the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, the word is Shaddai in Hebrew, falling down yet with open eyes. And I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. A star leads forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall dash the corners of Moab, and break down the sons of Turmoil. We drop down the verse... Uh, 21, and he looked upon the Kenites and took up this parable and said, Your dwelling place may be enduring, and your nest may be set in the rock. And like we said, that word is Salah. I gave a message not that long ago on Yah is our refuge, and showed how many times in Scripture it talks about the remnant being at the biblical Salah. The ones who were with us when we went to Jordan, we actually saw it. We saw the rock, and it isn't an easy place to get to. We didn't make it to the top, and... Uh, if we did, we might not be here today. It's a thousand steps all the way up, and not an easy track over there. But the Kenite shall be consumed until Assyria shall carry you away. And he took up this parable and said, Alas, who shall live when El does this? And ships shall come from the coast of Cyprus, and they shall humble Assyria, and they shall humble Eber, Eber, and he also shall come to the destruction forever. So we know the third beast, we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, is the EU, you know, the European Union, and they're going to come there and they're going to fight Assyria in this world war that's coming. But the main part is the people that will be protecting at least part of the remnant over there are being attacked. They're being attacked. Now what's interesting is what happens from that point. So like I said, I think we can pretty much conclude that when we're fleeing initially, those in Judea flee to the mountains, and from the scriptures we're reading in Revelation, we're fleeing east. We're fleeing over to the other side of the Jordan River, which is still Israel, the two and a half tribes that are over there, still part of the Promised Land. But then there's an interesting scripture from there that is also in time, in Isaiah 16. Because we don't know how long these Rechabites will be with the uh, remnant in the wilderness. It doesn't tell us. Is it a few months? Is it a few years? It's ambiguous. We don't know. We just know that there's a point where ISIS comes in, and they're attacking them, and there's trouble. So then we get to Revelation. Uh, I mean uh, Isaiah 16, and look what it says. Very interesting. Send a lamb to the ruler of the land 
from the rock of the desert. And that word again is Salah. So now they're being sent to the ruler of the land from the desert, from Selah, to the mountain of the daughter of Zion. So now when this trouble happens and they're being attacked, there's a messenger coming there saying, hey, these people are being attacked. We're in trouble. And where are they sending it to? To the daughter of Zion. For it is as a fleeing bird cast out of the nest. The daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. We were there at the Arnon River. We didn't. We, we were looking over it. We didn't go in. Yahweh willing, if we go back, we want to take that walk in there and do the water. But this is where it is. Take counsel, do judgment, make your shadow as the night in midday. Hide the outcast. Do not uncover the fugitive. So what's happening here? You know, as these people are coming and they're attacking these people that are protecting the remnant, there's trouble. That remnant's got to get out of there. And what does it say? Verse 4, let my outcast from Moab stay with you. He's telling Zion, let my outcast from Moab stay with you. Be a hiding place for them from the face of the destroyer. For the exactor has ceased, destruction has failed, the trampler is ended out of the land. And in mercy the throne shall be founded, and he shall sit on it in truth. Where? In the tabernacle of David. Wow. What did we say? Mount Zion, which this has been uncovered. The tabernacle of David. So yes, are we going east? Absolutely. Are we coming west? Absolutely. <laughs> All in Yahweh's timing. And in the mercy of the throne shall be founded, and he shall sit on it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and swift in righteousness. If we drop down to verse 14, he says, But now Yahweh has spoken, saying, Within three years... As the years of a hireling, then the glory of Moab will be abased with all the great host, and the remnant shall be few, small, not mighty. Three years is really interesting, right? Most of these things in the end time, 1,260 days, 1,290 days, 42 months, it's all around this three-year time frame. But the remnant is few, not mighty. But literally, they're coming to the tabernacle of David. If we go to Isaiah 30, a little more. Isaiah 30 and verse 27. Behold, the name of Yahweh comes from afar. His anger burns and is heavy as the uplifting of smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue like a devouring fire. And like an overflowing torrent, his breath shall divide to the neck to sift the nations. With the sieve of vanity and the misleading bridle on the jaws of people. The song shall be to you as the night when the feast is sanctified. And the gladness of heart is one going with the flute to come into the mount of Yahweh to the rock of Israel. And Yahweh will make the majesty of his voice heard. And he causes his arm to be seen coming down with raging anger and a flame of consuming fire, cloud burst and storm and hailstorms. For through the voice of Yahweh, Assyria will be crushed, the rod with which he strikes. So like we said that other day when we're talking about ISIS, it's at a point where they're trying to wipe out Judah, they're trying to wipe out the believers, and Yeshua has to return. So, remember, I'm not going to go there, but Zechariah 14, we read it a couple of times. Messiah appears, his feet go on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives spits and creates a valley where the people shall flee to. Right? So is it that the remnant already fled over there? How do we know when to return? When you see the shining coming out of the sky and the Mount of Olives splits in two and the valley is created because you'll, you'll be able to see it from Jordan. There's no doubt about that because the valley goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. And that's how we'll know it's time to go home. Yeah, well, the Dead Sea to the Red Sea. But you'll be able to see it from there. There's no doubt about it. Isaiah 27, 12 and 13. Isaiah 27, 12 and 13. And it shall be in that day Yahweh shall thresh from the channel of the river, it's usually talking about the Euphrates River, to the torrent of Egypt. And you shall be gathered one by one, sons of Israel. And it shall be in that day the great ram's horn shall be blown, when does Yeshua turn, return at the seventh trumpet? And those perishing in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt shall come and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Mount Zion. So again, the same thing. The... The, the congregation, the remnant, is fleeing to the mountains of Jordan. Who knows how long they're there, but a period of time. 
But then, when Assyria is coming, and they're destroying the people, Yeshua is coming to return, and the people are fleeing back to Mount Sinai. Obadiah 15, it's only one chapter there, so verse 15. Obadiah verse 15. For the day of Yahweh is near on all nations. We know Yeshua returns for the day of Yahweh. You have the seven seals, which we're seeing now, that tell us how close we are to the end time. Then you have seven trumpets, and you have seven bowls. Yeshua returns at the seventh trumpet. He has the bowls with him, and that's the wrath of Yahweh. For the day of Yahweh is near in all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reward shall return on your head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall continually drink. Yea, they shall drink and shall swallow, and they shall be as if it had not been. But the ones who escaped, right, the remnant, shall be on Mount Zion, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their own possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for straw. So remember, there's a time in Daniel 11 where who spared? Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Because the remnant is there. But then when the remnant leaves, there's no reason to spare them anymore because who's filling the gap? You know, whether it's ISIS or somebody else, even worse. We don't know. And they shall burn among them and consume, and no survivor shall be to the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken. But where is the remnant again? The be on Mount Zion. Remnant will be on Mount Sinai. Isaiah 25 in verse 4. Isaiah 25 in verse 4. And I'll tell you, the key of David just opens your mind in a way you can't imagine. You know, it just it it just puts things so clear. Isaiah 25 in verse 4. For you are a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in distress, a refuge from storm, a shadow from heat, because the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall. You shall lay low the noise of foreigners, like the heat in a dry place, the heat with shadow of cloud. The shouting of the terrifying ones shall be laid low. And Yahweh of hosts shall make a feast of fat things for all the people in this mountain, a feast of wine on the lees, a of fat things full of marrow, refined wines on the lees. And he shall destroy in this mountain the face of the covering which covers all people and the veil that is woven over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. We know that from 1 Corinthians 15. And Adonai Yahweh will wipe away tears from all faces. And he will reprove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken. And one shall say that they behold, this is our Elohim. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his Yeshua. For the hand of Yahweh will rest in this mountain, and Moab shall be trampled under him, even as Jor is trampled in the water of a dung pit. So again, all roads lead to Mount Zion. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 15. Matthew 24 and verse 15. And when you see the sign of uncleanness and desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which will stand in the holy place, he that reads, let him understand. Then let those in Judea flee into the mountains. The one on the roof, let him not go down to take anything out of his house. The one in the field, let him not turn back to take his garment. But woe to the one having a child in womb, or to those nursing in those days. And pray that your flight will not occur in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great suffering such as not has happened, from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. And except those days were shortened, not any flesh would live. But on account of the chosen, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Messiah, or here, do not believe. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up, and they will give great signs and wonders, so as to be led astray if possible, even the chosen. Behold, I tell you beforehand, that if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, he's in the, in the rooms, do not believe. So what happens, once the remnant is taken away, other people are going to hear about it, and people are going to try to get there, and they won't be able to. Unless you're accounted worthy to be there, you're not going to be there. 
You can't force yourself there. And look at what he says in verse 27. Very interesting. For as lightning comes forth, from where? From the east and shines as far as the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Where does Yeshua first return? Isaiah 63, from Basra. Yes. Where is Basra? In the east. Where is Mount Zion? In the west. As lightning comes from the east until the west, so is the coming of the Son of Man, from Basra to Mount Zion. That's what it tells us. From Basra to Mount Zion, east to west. Revelation 14, let's go to Revelation 14. And they saw and behold the Lamb standing where? On Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000, with the name of his Father having been written in their forehead. Is the name of Yahweh important? You better believe it is. And I heard a sound out of heaven as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of great thunder. And I heard a sound of harpers harping on their harps. And they sing as a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000. Those having been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not become defiled. Remember what we were talking about today, this morning? Sanctity to Yahweh. When we go out of Yahweh's sanctification, His holiness, we defile ourselves. These are the ones that have not become defiled, for they are pure. The bullet they found in that area where the temple was that I saw, what did it say? Purity to Yah. These are the ones following the Lamb wherever He may go. These are redeemed from among men being the first fruit to Yahweh and to the Lamb. And no decoy was found in their mouth, for they are unmarked before the throne of Yah. So here it is. The remnant who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're the ones living these sanctified lives. 144,000 are with Yeshua on Mount Zion. Don't have to add too much into that. Let's go to Joel 3. You may think from being there, wow, can he fit 144,000? But remember when he returns, and the mountain splits, the whole geography will be different. Joel 3, starting in verse 9. Now again, this, Joel is a little tiny book, three chapters, all end time, all telling about the day of Yahweh. I'm not going to go back there, but read chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, blow a ram's horn in Zion. Shout an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all those living in the land tremble, for the day of Yahweh approaches. It is near. Definitely this is end time, the end of the end time. So now let's look what happens in chapter 3, in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Sanctify a war. Awaken the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. So Yahweh is preparing for this great day. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hoods into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Gather yourself and come, all you nations, and gather yourself together all around. O Yahweh, bring down your mighty ones. Let the nation be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the Kidron Valley. Right behind us. For there I will sit to judge all the nations around. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the press is full. The vats overflow from their wickedness is great. I'm not going to go there, but Revelation 14 talks about this. And he's talking about the wine vats from the blood of the people, from how many people are going to die during this time. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened, and the stars shall gather in their light. And Yahweh roars from Zion. And he gives his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But Yahweh is a refuge for his people and a fortress to the sons of Israel. What is Zion called? It's called the citadel. That means fortress. You know? And that's where he is. He's right there. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Now again, this is, this is right as he's returning. This is while there's still war. This is before Armageddon. And what's happening? Yeshua's returning. He's protecting his people on Mount Zion. There's 144,000 with him. 
And Jerusalem shall be a holy thing, and strangers shall no more pass through her. And it shall be in that day the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the streams of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of Yahweh, Gihon Spring, and it shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will be a ruin, and Edom will become a desolate wilderness from the violence, and like we said, the word is Hamas, done to the sons of Judah, whose innocent blood they poured out in their land. This had a war here. We've seen some of that this summer. More of it to come. But Judah will dwell forever in Jerusalem to generation to generation. And I will cleanse their blood which I did not cleanse. And Yahweh is dwelling in Zion. That's why I say how special. You know, the day we were there in that mountain. You know, the preview that we're getting ready to see as the tabernacle of David that has fallen is being rebuilt. Wow. Isaiah 4. Isaiah 4 and verse 2. Isaiah 4 and verse 2. In that day the branch of Yahweh, who is the branch of Yahweh, Yeshua, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth for pride and for glory for the survivors of Israel. So again, we know many, many people are going to die. But he's saying, blessed be those who survive. And it shall be, he remaining in Zion, and he left in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, everyone who is written among the living in Jerusalem. When Yahweh shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and the blood of Jerusalem shall have been rinsed away from its midst by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. We know from Zechariah 13, two-thirds of the people here in this land are going to die. And the last third, only a remnant will come through. They're not hearing the message. As you have Elot, the homosexual capital of the world. They allow that. Homosexual parades going through Jerusalem. You know, 10, 15 years ago you would have never saw that, but you see it today. And we know the judgment is coming here because of that. Then Yahweh will create a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night, just like the remnant in the wilderness, remember? When they left Egypt. Over all the site of Mount Zion. Wow! Isn't that going to be something? Yahweh will create a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night over all the side of Mount Zion. And over her assemblies and over the glory will be a canopy. Tabernacle of David, the tent of David. And there shall be a booth, the tent of David, for a shade from the heat and for a refuge and for a hiding place from storm and rain. Wow. Yahweh protecting his people in his holy mountain, Mount Zion. I didn't go to that scripture, but remember in Joel 2.32, where is salvation? Mount Zion. Where is Yahweh dwelling? Mount Zion. And when will he come? When the tabernacle of David appears. And who is it written to? The last generation. How far are we from there? I don't know. <laughs> but it's got to be close. Everything else is pointing toward it. And that's what makes it so exciting. But there is one thing. If you don't go to the wilderness, you don't go to Mount Zion. There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. And that's why he says, when they say he's here, when they say he's here, don't, don't, don't try to go. You have to go to the wilderness. And we've been talking about this for a couple of years. First, we've been talking about the spiritual wilderness and preparing. But now we're talking about a real wilderness. The time is coming. The time is coming that Yahweh wants to see. And he wants to test every single one of us. Because for what he's offering us, if we even have 1% that wants to hold on to commercial Babylon, then we don't deserve the wilderness and we certainly don't deserve his kingdom. Revelation 13. You have to go to the wilderness or you don't go to the outside. Revelation 13. 1 through 5. And I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. And on its horns were ten crowns, and on its heads names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and its feet were like the feet of a bear, and its mouth as a lion's mouth. And the dragon <clears throat> gave its power to it, and its throne in great authority. So we know this is the one world end time government of Satan, ruled by Satan himself. And I saw one of its heads as having been slain to death, and its deadly wound was healed. And all the earth wondered after the beast. 
And they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with it? And a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies were given to it. And authority was given to attack 42 months. So again, when we look and see who the seven heads are, there are literally seven countries. One of the heads is, you know, destroyed, which is Babylon, as we're going to see, because this beast is also mentioned in Daniel. But when we get to Revelation, we don't see Babylon anymore. And when Babylon falls, they're going to think the whole world order is falling apart. It's the deadly wound. But then Satan will come from down from heaven after this war, and he's going to bring it together, and he will rule. It's not going to be George Bush or Barack Obama or anybody else. Satan will be ruling this new world order himself. So it's really interesting when you look at this. If we go to Daniel 7 for a minute. Daniel 7 and verse 4. I'm just going to read one verse. He says, Behold, another beast. First, there's the first beast. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and the wings are torn off. And then there's a second beast like a bear, and there's a third beast like a leopard. And then he talks about the fourth beast, how terrible it is. So here it is. If you put Revelation 13 with Daniel 7, it's the same beast. You have a lion, an eagle, a lion with eagle's wings. You have a bear, you have a leopard. You have a dragon. Isn't it interesting that if you look at the Security Council of the United Nations, who was on it? The Lion Great Britain, the Eagle US, both of them work together with the great air power, but he says the wings are plucked off, the great military air power, and they're made to stand like a man. Then you have the bear, Russia, you have the leopard, France, and you have the dragon, China. Now it says there's seven heads and ten horns. There's five permanent members. There is a uh, rotating president and a secretary general. There's seven heads to the United Nations. And there's ten horns. There's ten members worldwide who rotate on the Security Council. Exactly like the Bible says. It's there. What's interesting is, in Daniel it talks about the feet of clay. And they're partly of clay and partly of iron. And like it says, they are the... The, the seed of man, and the way clay doesn't mix with iron, these people don't mix. Well, when World War II ended in 1945, when the New World Order started at that point, because remember, 1945, you had the United Nations, you had World Bank, you had International Monetary Fund, all of it started in 1945. All of it. That was the beginning of the last generation. And you have these things started. But also, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the uh, general over the army of the United States forces at that time, and Khrushchev from Germany, uh, from uh, Russia, they sat down at a table together and they divided up Europe. And like it says, part of iron and part of clay. Isn't it interesting that Khrushchev means clay, Eisenhower means iron. Part was communist, part went toward the West. And like it said, it's the seeds of men. But the same way iron doesn't mix with clay, they didn't mix together. And now you're seeing the same thing. You're seeing the same thing as this, this falls apart. But clearly, when you look at those four beasts of Daniel, first you have Babylon. Very easy to prove Babylon's United States of America. Babylon is the number one military in the world. Babylon is the world policeman. Babylon is the one who trades more than anybody else. They're the steam engine of the economic world economy. Babylon is filled with pleasure seekers. Babylon is a land of idolatry. Come on, we don't have to go too far. There's nobody else. United States. Who else? Who else is taking over other nations for the last 30, 40, 50 years? Then when Babylon goes down, who's going to destroy Babylon? The Medes and the Persians. The Russians and the Iranians. This is being set up for the last decade. And we're seeing it come. We're, we're close to World War, I'm telling you. You have no idea. Look at the news every day. Regular news. How Russia has is, is been testing their, their nuclear capabilities. How uh, they're entering U.S. space with their F-16s. Uh, same with China. All these things that are coming up there that were close to this. So, the third beast is Greece in, in Daniel 7, which represents the EU. And the fourth beast is world government, which represented Rome. So, we're at that stage that you're seeing all these players are there. 
all these players are there. And it says that this beast speaks blasphemy, because really, the New World Order, One World Government has been here for a while. You know, everything that happens, we see the global community, you know, the international community, so it's there. And do they speak blasphemies against Yahweh? Yes. Because now they have world laws. It's, 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 it's against human rights to talk against homosexuality. It's a hate crime. Because they're saying homosexuality is, is a human right. They're saying it's like, like being racist against somebody's color or where they come from. But yet nobody is born homosexual. There's no homosexual gene. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice, an abomination lifestyle choice, that someone chooses. Nobody chooses what color they are or where they're born. But whether you're homosexual or not, you do choose. So certainly it's a perversion, but that's the way it is. We see it, abortion, mostly accepted worldwide. Very few countries that don't accept abortion. Evolution. You know, creation without a creator. This is all part of the blasphemies that's going out from this beast against Yahweh and His name. Revelation 13, let's go back there. Verse 6, And it opens its mouth in blasphemy toward Yahweh to blaspheme His name and His dwelling place and those dwelling in heaven. And it was given to it to make war with the saints and to overcome them. We're already seeing the beginning of this. You know, in the United States, you're really starting to see persecution come down, but it's just on the surface of it. Other parts of the world, Syria, Iraq, wow, look what you're seeing there. I mean, because of, we, we heard Andrew White talk about, these people are dying, children that are dying, because simply they believe in Yeshua. And authority was given it over every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation, world government. And all those dwelling in the earth will worship him. So it's not forced upon the world. They want this, because after this war comes, this horrific war that we talked about that's coming on the Euphrates River, you know, with ISIS or something worse, but it's going to come over there. Revelation 9 tells us that. And a third of mankind dies. Everybody's just going to want peace. We've had enough of this war. We've had nuclear war. We want peace. And that's where Satan fills the gap. I'm not going to go back there, but we know it in Daniel 8. And he deceives the people through flatteries and through a false peace at that time. So when this comes, everybody worships the beast. They want it. It's not, it's not this tyrant, you know. It's not this, like they, you always see all these things in America, you know, from these people against the world government saying they're trying to push this on us and force it. No, 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 the people want it. This is something that they want. And all those dwelling in the earth will worship him. Those of whom the names had not been written in the book of life. And of the Lamb, having been slain from the foundation of the world. Anyone who has an ear, let him hear. We were talking about it before. Where do you want to stand? Do you want to stand in the new world order, or do you want to stand in the kingdom of Yahweh? Because it's so diverse now. And I don't know how long before we're at this point, but I can tell you the point we're at now, it's night and day. It's night and day what the world is out there. Everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go, because the system of Babylon is brought everywhere. That this system that the beast has is here now. It's not coming. The system of the beast is here now. And woe to him who tries to fight it, right? Try to, try, to, try to leave your country. Try to come out of the system. See what happens. It's not easy. It's not easy because that's what prophecy says. Him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's go to verse 15. And it was given to put life into the image of the beast... So that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You know, they say it's like Monday morning on Wall Street. You know, they have this picture of a man going into like this machine and turning it on and clicking it, you know, and rolling it and the system gets started, right? You know, they're just trying to show emphasis. But it really is like that. That the, the system itself is the image of the beast, you know, because that's what, when you look out here and you see this system like I'm talking about, you know, that will justify abortion, but then put down Yahweh's Ten Commandments. It's an evil system. And it's here. It's here today. And unfortunately, there's nowhere in the world where you can go to get away from it. And that's why Yahweh's destroying Babylon, because Babylon has brought this system to the world. It's a system of trading, it's a system of money, and it's a system of oppression. And you know what? The Americans, they love their cocoa. They really do. 
I can tell you, I, I come from there. So that cocoa's got to be cheap. So they don't care in the Ivory Coast, you know, and these other places in Africa. So I'll tell you, kid, for 50 bucks, we need people to work in these cocoa fields. we got to keep the price low. Because the life in the West is worth more than the lives in these other countries. That's the way they think. And don't think it's not in the church the same thing. They have the false rapture theory, right? Well, Yahweh would never let us get wrath. Well, every nine minutes, a believer is being killed somewhere in the world. Every nine minutes. But when it comes to America, then they're all going to get raptured up to heaven. Every life is worth something to Yahweh, and no life is more precious than another life. And shame on Western society, because they want the good life that our brothers and sisters, and I've been there, with babies on their back working 12 hours a day, and Harrison can attest to this, picking tea. They get 10 cents a basket. It's unrighteous. It's evil before Yahweh. And every one of us is part of that system. Every single one of us is part of it. But the Bible says you better come out of it because Yahweh is coming to destroy it. And the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the freemen and the slaves it causes that they give to them a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. Even that not any could buy or sell unless the one having the mark or the name of the beast or the number of its name. Three things here. Here is the wisdom. Let him who has understanding compute the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and its number is 666. The only other time that number shows up in Scripture is 1 Kings 10, 14, telling about how much gold Solomon accumulated. Really interesting place to put it. But three is a unity number. 666, six is the number of man. So now you have 666, you have man unified. You have the Tower of Babel all over again. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about a global unified system that is 100% against the promises and against the character and culture of Yahweh. And like I said, the system is already here. You know, maybe we don't have these other things set up, but the system is here. We already see it. We all live in it. We all see the bondage that it brings. Babylon makes slaves of the souls of men. And even the people that live in America are slaves. You know, we go to these other third world countries and somehow they think every American is rich. Don't think so. They may have a lot of credit and even that's been different since 2009. But there's not many rich people anymore in America except the elite. If you look in the last 10 years, and you can look this up on the internet, the graph of, of wealth in America has divided at a pace you can't believe. And it's like now something like 3 or 4% of the people in the country own something like 80% of the wealth. So it's really dividing there, and the middle class is just disappearing. So 3 is a unity number, 6 is the number of man, 666 six, six is man unified against Yahweh. It's the Tower of Babel all over again. Let us build a tower, it's top the heavens. And this is what man wants to do. You know, one of the things with Babylon, it's interesting, it talks about in uh, Jeremiah 50 and 51, 51, 9, about, although if Babylon should ascend to the heavens, I will cast them down. And that word for ascend in the Hebrew is NASA. You know, the word is NASA. You know, Babylon has a space program. They're trying to get to the heavens, just like the Tower of Babel. But we're going to see Yahweh's not thinking it's very funny. Let's go to Psalm 2, and let's see what Yahweh thinks of all this. Psalm 2. Why have the nations raged, and the people are meditating on emptiness? This is Yahweh's answer to the new world order. The kings of the earth have placed themselves, yea, the rulers have plotted together against Yahweh and his Messiah saying, we will break their bands in two and throw off their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens will laugh. Yahweh shall mock at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger, and in his wrath he will terrify them. The day of Yahweh, when it comes, you better believe, it's a terrifying time. Yea, I have set my king on my holy mount in Zion. 144,000 don't have nothing to fear. They're in Mount Zion with the king. But remember, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. There's no decoy in their mouth. They're not part of the system of Babylon. 
I will declare concerning the statue of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations as your inheritance. And as your possession, the ends of the earth. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now then be wise, O kings. Be taught, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, O oh, the blessings of all those who flee to him for refuge. Here we are. We're living there. Yahweh mocks the New World Order plans. The whole society, the system created by Babylon, is against Yahweh and against his Torah. So what is he talking about here? What is this mark that he talks about? A mark in the right hand, a mark in the forehead. Because there's the mark of Satan, the mark of man, like we said, man united, 666, the number of man, the number of unity, united against Yahweh. But Yahweh also has a mark. So let's go to Deuteronomy 6, and let's really see what the mark of both of these are. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall diligently teach them to your sons, and shall speak of them as you sit in your house, and as you walk in the way, and as you're lying down, and as you're rising up. And you shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. What's between your eyes? Your mind. Your mind is what you think. Your hand is what you do. That's what he's talking about. And I don't know if there'll be a chip. There might be, there may not be, to be honest with you. The more time's going on, I'm thinking the chip is a big smoke screen. Because everybody that's already partaking of the mark of the beast, every one of us is. We're all part of the system. That we're all saying, I'll never take that chip. But we're sure buying and selling. We're sure partaking in the system. So, I, I'm not really too worried about the chip. They could, half of you can have a chip. They could have put a chip in you when you got a flu shot. Uh, you could have been chipped here and there. They're chipping babies sometimes in hospitals. Who knows? So if somehow they put a chip in you and you don't even know it, do you think Yahweh would take your eternal life? Of course not. No. But if you give your allegiance to the system that Satan has created, that he's the king of, because remember, this is the only time in 6,000 years that you have two kings on this earth. One is reigning in Mount Zion. One is reigning over the rest of the earth. And Yahweh's saying, you choose. i got to let you know, you, you choose Mount Zion, you're not going to be able to buy and sell in Satan's system. Because in his system, you're going to have to be part of it. You're going to need those little green pieces of paper that say, in God we trust. The Babylonian deity who's Satan. <coughs> Which one do you want? Do you want Mount Zion? Or do you want the kingdom of Satan? The mind is how you think. Your hand is what you do. The mark of the beast, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. And like I said, maybe they'll put the chip, maybe they won't. It's immaterial. It's immaterial because all that's doing is getting you away from what you should be doing now. And believe me anyway, I'll guarantee you 80% of the people who claim they'll never take a chip, they'll take it in a second. I know in Western society, when even on Yom Kippur, if you're telling someone you're fasting, they're like, a whole day? You can't go without food for 24 hours, you'll die! No. Won't die. <laughs> That's the way it is there. It's a land of pleasure seeking. It's a land of, of, of idolatry. It's a land that people waste. They say now in America, we saw a thing on the news, the average American wastes a thousand pounds of food a year. A thousand pounds. Well, people are starving to death. We lived in Honduras, we saw children in their diapers running in the garbage pits looking for food. And we take more than we can have? Why? Because somebody else might get it and it won't be there when I want it. And if I don't eat it all, I'll throw it in the garbage. It's covetousness. It's not the spirit of Yahweh. And it's the system of Babylon that has come to the world. And unless you come out of it, you're not going to go to the wilderness and you're not going to be in Mount Zion and you're not going to be in the kingdom. Because the scary part of this is all the earth worships the beast and then he says... The beast gives the mark, 
And then it tells us all the earth takes the mark. Everyone's taking it. They love it. They love that system. And unless you come out of it, you're going to go to the lake of fire. Because it says whoever takes the mark of the beast goes to the fire with brimstone. Just read Revelation 12, 13, and 14. And it's a scary story. Because we're living in those times. We're living in those times. Whoever takes that mark goes to the lake of fire. Like I said, will they chip? Won't they chip? Who knows? But probably it's a smokescreen because already the world is worshipping the image of the beast. If you were to leave the system created by Babylon and go to the wilderness, you'd have no paper money. You couldn't buy and sell. The dollar is the world's reserve currency. It's the only currency in the world that will be accepted anywhere you go, and it's for that reason, they can print, 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 print. Since 2009, they've printed more than 5 trillion more dollars in debt. Because all the world accepts that system. And Satan's currency of his global government, that's really what it is. He is the God that people are trusting in, certainly not Yahweh. Then when you go after that, after Revelation 13, we just read it to the end. Remember, the chapter breaks are put in later by man. So all of these are letters without chapter breaks. So right after chapter 13, when he's telling you about the mark of the beast and you can't buy and sell, the very next verse is, And I saw, behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, with whom were 144,000. And these are people that left the system. One of the biggest questions that comes up to me with Babylon is, how do you survive? I don't have the money to leave. How can I survive? And I always say, if it's about money, we've got something wrong. Because he's coming to destroy that system of money. And now it's really clear. You know, because the children of Israel, when they were in Egypt in bondage, they asked the same question. How on earth can any army of this world break the power of Pharaoh? And yet Yahweh broke the power of Pharaoh and parted the Red Sea. And then when there's two million people here in the wilderness, the next thing was, how do we get food in a desert? How do we get water in a desert? wasn't with little green piece of papers that said, in God we trust. No, it was in faith in Yahweh, and that's what's missing in the society. And I say, people have a hope. They hope Yahweh exists, but they don't have faith. Because if we had faith, we wouldn't be living in this society. We wouldn't be living the lives we're living, and everything would be very much different. And I always say, I, I, I make an analogy, I say, you have more faith, most people, in the electric company than you do in Yahweh. Because you get an electric bill every month. And if that bill is past due, and it says, October 29th, shut off. By hook or crook, you're going to borrow that money, and you're going to be down there paying for your bill. Because you know that the owner of that electric company will follow through what he said he was going to do. Shut off your electric. And then I ask everybody, do you know the name of the guy who owns your electric company? No. So most people have more faith in a company that you don't even know who he is than in Yahweh. Because if we had the same faith, because Yahweh says, and I'll go there, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. But without faith it is impossible to please Yahweh. For it is right that the one drawing near to Yahweh should believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's one or the other. And like I said, for most people it's a hope. But it's not faith. Faith is full assurance. It's the evidence of things not seen. And we have to have that full faith. Or what we're doing is doubting he even exists. Because either he does exist and then everything's fine. If he parted the Red Sea and he... Took water out of the rock of Horeb that we even see today... Why couldn't he do it again? And he will. Isaiah 48. I'm not going to go there. But it says it. He will cause water to come out of the rock. So we're going to see it. We're going to see it again. And Yahweh will. And the only thing, let me say this and listen to this very carefully. 
The only thing that stops you is you don't believe it 100%. And you'll say, no, 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 I believe it. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't believe it 100%. Because if you did, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. And if you believed it, you'd have no fear of leaving Babylon and you already would be out of there. You know? Because let's say Daniel is resurrected today. And Yahweh says, Daniel, the kingdom isn't here yet, but it's close. But I'm going to give you the ability to go anywhere on the earth and live that you want to. You can choose any continent in any place. And they'll say, okay, that sounds good. Can you tell me a little bit about each place and I'll make a decision? Do you think Daniel would choose Babylon? Do you think he would choose the most vile, evil, wicked place that denies Yahweh's very existence? That allows infanticide, two million babies a year to be killed there. And they say it's a woman's right to choose. Sure is, but it's also her right to die. Because the soul that kills, it shall die. And abortion is murder. Who's, who's standing up for the life of the unborn child? You know, it's part of the, the very uh, articles of constitution in America. Everybody has the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happy, happiness. What about the life of the unborn child? And we just go along and we say, what can you do? Two million a year. We talk about the Holocaust, which is horrific. Horrific. Do you know there's more, a half a million more children killed in America every year than was killed in the Holocaust? Every year. Year after year after year. You're up to 50, 60 million babies just since 1973. Since Roe versus Wade came about. So what is it? That's what I say. Unless you understand how much faith you're lacking, you're never going to get it. And what you have to do is you have to realize it. You have to tell Yahweh and you have to ask Him for it. You know, He's a Father that will give it to you. But if you're laid to say it and you're rich and increased with goods and need of nothing, no, 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 faith ain't my problem. He's never going to give you what you don't ask. You have to go to Him and you have to pray with all your heart. You know, remember the man where... He wanted Yeshua to heal his child. And Yeshua told him to believe. And he said, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I'm not saying we have no faith. But we don't have enough. And that's what we need to ask him. Father, I believe. But help me with my unbelief. Because we're seeing all these things come about. And Yahweh's ready to take his people to the wilderness. Why did Yahweh take Israel out to the wilderness? He could have took them right to the promised land, right? I was telling somebody that today. Why shouldn't you come right from Babylon over to here? Because you've got to go to the wilderness. Because you've got to get the culture of Egypt out of the Israelites. That's what it was about. He could have taken them right here. It was a much shorter track, I can tell you that much, coming from down the below Sinai, coming up here through the Sinai Peninsula. It's way better than going all the way around on the other side of the Jordan, all the way through Edom. But Yahweh had to get the culture of Egypt out of the Israelites and to get them to totally trust and rely on Him for everything. And that's why He gave them the manna every day. That's why He took the water out of the rock. He could have had it another way. He had to get them to trust and rely on Him for everything. And like I said, in the system of Babylon, we don't want to do that. We want to work. We want to get money. We want an IRA. We want all these things. We want retirement. We want the checks from the government. That's why Babylon created a nanny state. Because they want you to be dependent on them and not Yahweh. But it's not a ticket to the kingdom. And when Babylon falls, so does the whole financial system in the world. And you'll hear a cry that day like you have not heard in this earth since the beginning of time. Now if you're out of the system, it won't make a difference. But if you're part of Babylon, you're in the middle of it. You know what? You're going to be sitting there thinking, what do I do? If you're out of it, you already know what to do. People have asked me many times about leaving America. When is it going to fall? When I say, look, I don't know. But all I can tell you is, I left there 15 years ago. So I don't have to worry about it. I'm already out. I'm out of the land. I'm not totally out of the system. Now that's the next part that I want to work on. Yahweh took them to get the culture of Egypt out of the Israelites and to get them to totally trust in Him. That's why He took them to a desert where they couldn't grow their own food, they had no water, because they had to learn to trust Him for everything. 
Same reason why, probably, he's taking the people over toward Jordan. Because that's the same area. Same area where they originally went through. So before you get to Mount Zion, you've got to go to the wilderness. you got to go. You know, Isaiah 1.6 says, The whole head is sick, from the top of the head to the bottom of the foot. And that's not only Babylon, but it's the whole world. It's a sick system. The whole world is sick. From the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. That's why Yeshua comes to destroy it completely and start his kingdom anew. Unless you leave the system of Babylon, which is worldwide. It's not just about leaving the U.S. As America, Babylon has brought the system to the world. You'll never go to the wilderness. And a good chance you'll miss out on the kingdom. As if you stay in the system of world democracy, you are partaking in the sins of Babylon. And also partaking in the mark of the beast. Because that is the image of the beast. As time goes on, it will only get harder to leave the system, not easier. And it makes it pretty simple. It's really not that hard. If you don't take the mark, you can't buy and sell. It's that simple. If you leave the system, you're not going to have money. You're not going to have paper. You're not going to have a bank account. You're not going to have credit cards. And you're not going to be able to buy and sell. The congregation of Yeshua in the wilderness is an example to us for almost a thousand years. How they totally lived up in the mountains and they lived away from society. These people were tailors, they were farmers, they were craftsmen, but they never compromised with the world. That's why they stayed a thousand years up there. Because they didn't want to corrupt themselves, in which they thought at that time Rome was Babylon. They also wanted to stay out of Babylon, and that was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was as brutal as you ever wanted to see. Same as you see ISIS today, killing children of believers, making the believers walk down with the children's heads around their neck. Same thing as you see happening today. And yet, these people didn't waver. They said, and it's in my book, those testimonies, they said, you could take our life, and you know what? You're only putting us that much quicker in the kingdom. But we will never change. We will never denounce our faith. We will never announce our Savior. 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow. Written 2,000 years ago. Compare it to today. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away in its lust, but the one doing the will of Elohim abides forever. So it's a real... The decision is easy, but the application is not. And like I said, Babylon doesn't come out of you in a second. You know, where you grew up, your culture, it's part of you. And it's going to take a lot of time. And the longer you wait to at least start coming out of that system, the less chance every day you have that you will. And like I said, it's, you're, you're, you're not going to do it in the night, but you have to start at least in small ways. Revelation 18 Revelation 18. In verse 1 through 5. And after these things I saw another cherub coming down out of heaven, having great authority, and the earth was lighted up from its glory. And he cried in a strong great voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, it is fallen. And it has become a dwelling place of those possessed by demons, and a home of every foul spirit. In a home of every unclean bird, even the home of every unclean and hateful beast. I find it really, really interesting that over the last couple of years, of all the animals that are mysteriously dying in America, birds just falling out of the sky, you know, hundreds or thousands, fish by the millions that are coming up on the shores, and all the demonic uh, presence that you're seeing in the news of literally demon-possessed people running around everywhere. You know, what is going on here? Shootings almost every day. But that's what he says. Babylon is falling. It's the place of every foul spirit. Because of the wine of the anger of her fornication, which the nations have drunk, even the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth became rich from the power of her trade. You know, America is more than double the world economy of the next four or five people put together. And why are the... Merchants of the earth rich because Babylon is the buyer, not only the seller. 
That's how they became rich. Why are they crying when Babylon falls? Because no one buys their merchandise anymore. India has 1.5 billion people. China has 1.6 billion people. They're not buyers. They're sellers. The buyers are in Babylon. And that's why they're crying when Babylon falls. The earth became rich from the power of her tree. And I heard another voice out of heaven saying, Leave the land of her. Come out of her, my people, some of the translations say. That you may not share in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. Because her sins joined together even reach up to heaven. And Yahweh remembered her unjust deeds. Babylon has gone worldwide. It's time to leave the world. There will be nothing left of it anyway, like we said. Yeshua is coming to burn it up. And it's a test of faith to see if we'll rely on Yahweh for everything. So like I said, the wilderness is coming to a place near you. And only He knows the time frame of it. But if you don't start really seriously preparing, seriously start thinking about coming out of that system, you never will. Because like I said, when the bottom falls out, you'll be scared to death. There will be a famine in that day. It talks about an Amos. Not a famine of food, but a famine of the word. They'll control the internet. You won't be here, able to hear sermons. Who knows, you know, probably flying will be limited. And it's all going to happen like that. So it's not going to be through the buddy system that's going to get you through. You have to start getting that faith in Yahweh now. And just like Abraham, get up and leave. Abraham got up and leave. You have to start believing in his word and taking it for faith value. And building that faith. And like I said, don't panic. Take it a day by day. But don't put it off either. Don't put it off. Because the day is coming quickly. We're seeing these things come. And as exciting it is, as it is for Yahweh to reveal these things, like Mount Zion, it's going to be so much more glorious in the day His feet are there. So why live for Babylon one more day when the tabernacle of David has been lifted? Yahweh bless. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.